We live in an era that seems to have become addicted to the idea of the simple. From Staples' easy button to Nike's just do it. The overriding message is that simplification is the way to better everything. I am here to tell you that too much simplicity is perhaps more dangerous than not enough. Simplification can be dangerous, very dangerous. Thus, my lessons without the hype. The pathways to success can be very complicated and very complex. Simplicity and simplification as a shortcut can be very seductive. But as your mother told you a thousand times, not that you believed her perhaps, there are no shortcuts to any place worth going to. And despite its seductiveness, often simplification is not an effective shortcut. The seductiveness happens because we believe that there is a relationship between simplicity and effectiveness. When we make things simple, we make them more effective. More is better. Our goal is thus supposed to be more and more simplification. But in truth, this graph contains a lie. The truth is that simplification only works up to a point and then it fails and often quite miserably. What happens when we oversimplify is that we offload the source of meaning, how it is that we understand the thing we are talking about, away from the simplification we're using and onto the context and the environment. In that offloading, we must confront a very important truth, that every one of us is different, and thus we each will see and deal with that context and the environment differently. When we simplify by transferring the source of meaning to the context and the environment, what we are doing is actually increasing complexity. And so our very idea of simple crumbles away. As Albert Einstein told us, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. When you allow the idea of simple to trump nuance and evidence and logic well, most of the time, the simplifications which result will fail to work. Simplification only works when it is both appropriate to the situation and to the others with whom one must deal. Einstein's quote implies two things are required for any effort to simplify to actually succeed. Balance and appropriateness. Balance requires work, while appropriateness can be rather elusive. True simplicity has the added power of appropriateness. Yes, you could probably hammer the square peg into the round hole with enough force. Or you might just break both the peg and the bench that the hole was a part of. The goal is for things to fit together naturally without force fitting. Appropriateness is a quality of attunement, of resonance, of being one with the context. When we lack that sense of resonance, of being attuned to the environment and the context, then often we encounter ambiguity. Ambiguity works against our notion of the simple. Two or more conflicting meanings need resolution. That ambiguity, that need for resolution, can get in the way of our success. Ambiguity is a major source of complexity. Sometimes what we think is simple because we have personally simplified it may be better understood as being complicated or complex or ambiguous, which means that our very act of simplifying has let us down and left us confused. And then again, sometimes what we individually see as simple or obvious others see as something else. Perhaps they see a different symbol or a reality which is more complicated than the one we are addressing. We just disagree. Agreement and appropriateness are the keys to every negotiation, every successful communication, and every solved problem. So too is having just the right amount of ambiguity. But agreement, appropriateness, and ambiguity 
all create the opportunity for misunderstanding, or in this case, potentially a need for Pepto-Bismol. If you ignore agreement and appropriateness, you can drown in ambiguity and in the dissonance which results from the clashes amongst two or more conflicting and unresolved meanings. Instead of simple, you quickly find yourself in complex, with layers upon layers of twisted and interconnected issues, all of which need resolution. Or you could react by doing nothing, frozen to inaction by the uncertainty which all that ambiguity, lack of agreement, and lack of appropriateness have created. Richard Rorty, one of the 20th century's great pragmatists, noted that we deal with the problems of ambiguity, lack of agreement, and lack of appropriateness all the time. We tend to call them misunderstandings, or even worse. Rorty said, knowledge is not a matter of getting reality right, but rather a matter of acquiring habits of action for coping with reality. When simplicity isn't obvious, when it just doesn't present itself to us, what we do is create it. We cope by creating our own simplifications. In fact, most of the time, the simplicity that we deal with is actually our own construction, a product of our own heads. What we do is create our own reality. We see the world, we process the world, but the way we process it is to tell a story, a story which makes sense of what it is we think we see, of what it is we think we need to deal with. And most of the time, we tell a simple story. We say that the world is X, or the world is Y, or the world is Z. What we do is filter the reality that we see. How? First, we limit our field of attention. We narrow the context of what it is we are dealing with. Then, we limit the factors to be considered. We assert a set of boundaries and constraints. Then, we predict likely outcomes given the boundaries and constraints that we just imposed. In effect, at this point, we have constructed in our heads a set of multiple realities. Then finally, what we do is pick amongst those multiple realities. By choosing from amongst our predictions, we have taken the complex, complicated reality that we first encountered and turned it into a simple construct. That construct becomes the story we tell, the narrative that we use to explain the situation to others and to ourselves. Of course, sometimes that simplicity is not necessarily the clear, unambiguous answer we seek. Indeed, simplicity does not mean certainty, and certainty itself can be quite elusive. Look at this picture. Now look away. Now look again. What do you see? Are you sure? Did you see the peasant girl? Or did you see the man? Or did you see both? Can you see both at the same time? It's ambiguous. A problem with ambiguity and the lack of certainty is that the simplicity that we seek may not be shared by other people. It is not that they do not share our goal it's that they see something different than what we do. Perhaps one of us saw the peasant girl and the other saw the man. Perhaps one of us sees four and the other one sees three. Regardless, we tell the story we see and not the story that others around us see. The simple lesson here is that context matters. The slice of pizza which seems very appealing while on the restaurant plate on the left, seems anything but appealing while sitting on the manhole cover on the right. The focus on context reveals three words or ideas, which all too often we get very wrong. The notion of the simple, the story that we tell, 
and the model that we use as the central character in that story. What happens is that we resort to shortcuts, and shortcuts lead to problems. Simplification works only when it is appropriate, when it has achieved the right balance amongst the ideas that work for you, your listeners, the context, and the goal. Otherwise, you find yourself in the chasm, and chasms are hard places to get out of. Consider, if you will, McDonald's switch to having breakfast all day. It's simple, it's direct, it resonates, and we all can tell the story. This is an example of simplification just working. Contrast this with Amazon's Prime Same Day Delivery Service, a service filled with ifs and ands and buts and all too many fine print conditions. The list of things which qualify and the list of things which do not. Simplification attempted and failed. Again, contrast that with Amazon's buy now with one click button. The one-click button is near-perfect simplification. Its name and its image convey just what it does. Even though most of us have absolutely no idea of the process by which one-click purchases actually happen, it is as if it was all just a black box. But it works. Indeed, to the listener, and quite often to ourselves, stories and labels are black boxes. We see the black box, but we have limited access to what is inside it. We use the black box so as to simplify. By black box, I do not mean the one on an airplane which collects as much data as possible. I mean a set of words or a sign or a description or a model, something that we use to simplify how we talk about some bigger thing. We use black boxes because we can refer to them like shorthand instead of having to spell out the details of the bigger thing itself. And quite often, we use black boxes because they allow us to take one of those dangerous shortcuts. By referring to the black box, we can avoid having to actually learn the details of that bigger thing. We can make the complex appear to be simple. But remember, shortcuts are often dangerous. We use these black boxes as if they were the more detailed, nuanced thing they refer to. Black boxes allow us to tell stories about as ifs. We can talk about a road as if it was a straight line. We can talk about a drive as if it was one thing and not a journey through many places. We can talk about our job as if it too was only one thing and not some interconnected network of many things. Some as ifs work better than others. For years, Starbucks was able to suggest that it was a third place, some as if version of a comfortable place to just be. By contrast, the idea of a healthy meal, at least as constructed by most state and local school departments, fails to be an as if for good food. Indeed, the entire meaning seems to get twisted around. It's an as if for something else. What happens is that we talk as if we are all talking about the same thing. But we are not. We each approach stories, labels, and the like from the background information we have in our heads and the context which we may be paying attention to at the time. Because we are all unique, it is a mistake to assume that the background information and context is the same between the storyteller and the listener, or amongst multiple listeners. The gap between what we think we are saying and what the listener is hearing is what provides the opportunity for that chasm. The chasm is a place where both simplification and storytelling fail. It is a place where ambiguity reigns and where disagreements are the order of the day. Let's try this with an example. I imagine that we are all very familiar with the climate change debate. It is marked by rather vocal disagreements and rather sharp dissonance. When you look at the graph of temperatures 
usually associated to display global warming, this is the graph you see. Please notice the red line that slopes upward towards the right-hand side. When scientists and others who support the notion that global warming is an ever-present and ongoing problem speak about this graph, this red line is the conception they have in mind. But there is another way to look at exactly the same data. Instead of drawing one overall trend line, instead we can look for periods of stability amongst the rising trend. And that is what this version of the graph shows. It is the same data, but drawn with a different interpretation. When contrarians suggest that there are opportunities where the rise in global temperatures have slowed or stabilized, it is this interpretation of the graph which they are talking about. It uses the same underlying data. It is the same graph, but it is a different interpretation. These clashing interpretations are illustrative of what happens in that chasm, the chasm of dissonance. We have a high level of similarity, but we have two conflicting interpretations. And as a result, people engage in strong disagreements. What the climate change example highlights is that we are stuck having to deal with the not simple portions of the world. If we choose to just deal with the simple portions, we're not dealing with enough. And in dealing with the not simple, we need to be aware that one critical part of appropriateness is balance. We need the variety of forces that we are dealing with to be in some kind of requisite balance, where requisite is defined by our goals or our objectives. We call this requisite variety. This illustration of the forces which apply to a flying wing is an example of requisite variety. The forces get balanced, but the nature of the balance needs to be appropriate to both the purpose, so are we flying, are we taking off, are we landing, and to the context. What kind of wind is there? What's the weather? What's the weight of the plane? Things like that. This chart highlights many of the forces that need requisite variety in our storytelling. The story is often used as a mediator between the observations we make about the environment and the behavior we engage in or that we desire others to engage in. Requisite variety is affected not only by the observations and behaviors, but also by the feedback loops that happen amongst all these things. These feedback loops can amplify the effects of our observations or behaviors, or they could dampen them. And we must not forget that any situation we are in also has a context, an environment. That environment will affect our observations which may in turn then affect our story, which may then in turn affect the environment, and so on. So too with our behavior, which may get modified by the environment, or our behavior may modify the environment itself. These cycles can be very complex and thus create our desire to simplify. But those cycles also govern whether or not simplification can actually work if you remember from perhaps 20 slides back, appropriateness, like agreement, is a critical component of making simplicity and simplification work. Black boxes, labels, and stories can all be very powerful when they are used appropriately and when the listeners can agree with what they hear. They help to package those complex and ambiguous cycles I just showed you and make them actionable. Because the goal of any action matters, purpose is a major determinant of appropriate, which means we need to know the goal, the why of the story we are telling. And we need to have some idea of how the story we tell or the black box we use can help get us toward the goal. Let's take an example. This is the map or graph of the London subway system. It is a great map if you are using it to determine how to go from station to station on the tube itself. But it is a horrible and misleading map if you try to use it to determine how to walk, or worse, drive between tube stations. The requisite variety of this map is geared to its purpose, providing information about how to use the tube system. 
it is not geared to any other. Oftentimes, when we think about the London tube situation, what our minds summon up is that map. And this is an example of an important distinction that our society does not seem to actually grasp, the distinction between a true model and a static description. Descriptions are representations used to simplify the system being modeled. The London subway system map is a description of the London subway. One composes a drawing, a symbol, or a schema as a representation, and then gives that representation a label. And we use that label to speak of the system so described. But static descriptions are not true models. They have no possibility for you to simulate potential changes. You cannot ask, what if? No one has given you the opportunity to redraw how the tube system works. What ifs are essential before committing to an action. True models allow what ifs to be simulated and include a means for any selective what if to be implemented. So when I look at the map of the subway system and I decide whether I'm going route A or route B, that's a what if. But it doesn't change the system it changes my route. By allowing ourselves to conflate the meanings of these two words, description and model, we tend to lose the distinction which makes the difference. Only true models help you plan or simulate potential interventions. Descriptions cannot. True models explicitly describe how interventions are possible. More importantly, True models allow us to experiment by simulating what might happen in the representation before we actually attempt to intervene in the system itself. I can draw plans for how I'm using the tube. Models allow us to play. They allow us to experiment. They allow us to understand what might happen. So looking at this chart, the triangles represent the experiments we conduct in or with a model. With feedback, we refine the representation, conduct more experiments, and refine some more. Eventually, we pick one experiment and the results which the model suggests will happen as our action item, the thing we're going to do. We then implement that action item in the form of an intervention in the real system, or in the form of attempting to cause some kind of a change. And if we have a true model, then our representation has allowed us to explicitly describe the results from our chosen intervention. Let's take an example. The plastic food, which is on display in many a restaurant in Japan, is an example of pure description. Pre-given labels, categories, pictures, plastic, they can be very efficient. Much of our simple world works when we use these pre-given labels and categories. Not everything needs a model. So if my goal is to order dinner, then the plastic food as a description works great. I can point to it. The waiter will bring it to me. But if my goal is to cook dinner, well, now that plastic food description is not so helpful. It doesn't tell me what the ingredients are, how long to cook, what I can play with, what I can't. For that, we have recipes. Recipes are true models. We can imagine interventions. We can imagine slight changes to ingredients or changes to instructions. And then, after imagining, we go cook dinner. Let's go back to those three problematic words, simple, story, and model. The issues which make them problematic all revolve around the concept of appropriateness. What is an appropriate model? An appropriate story? What amount of simplification is appropriate for a given situation and purpose? Remember, simplification works only when it is appropriate. And without appropriateness, we risk getting stuck in that horrible chasm of dissonance. So what 
Does this seemingly all-powerful word, appropriateness, actually mean in this context? It turns out that appropriateness gets defined by how well the black box or story you are using meets three tests. One, do you have a true model or merely a description? This will tell you whether you have given the listener an opportunity for action in your narrative. Two, are you generating resonance among the listeners? This will tell you whether your black box or story matches both the context and the understanding of the listeners you're trying to reach. Three, is the story, black box, or label complex enough, or perhaps too complex? Getting the balance right is critical. So how do you cope when simplification fails? When trying to turn the complicated or the complex into something simple just isn't working the way you want it to. The answer is you have to ask some questions. You ask where the failure lies. Is it in the lack of requisite variety? Is it in the kind of narrative you're telling? Or is it in the kind of black box that you're using? Or some combination of all three? And then, having asked those questions, there are two steps to take. First, it's critical to remember that actions require that you be talking in terms of true models and not merely a description. You need to make sure then that you actually have a true model. If you don't, then you need to determine what it is that you have to do or change or know in order to actually model the situation so that what ifs and interventions are possible. With a model, you can rehearse potential actions. And it is in the ability to rehearse that you find resilience. And that ability allows you to find the simple narrative that you want to tell. The second step lies in remembering that the most important variable is appropriateness. And there are no shortcuts. If your story or your black boxes are either too simple or too complex, they will not resonate. They won't be appropriate. You need to determine what to do, change, or know so that you can generate resonance, so that what the listeners that you need to deal with hear and respond to matches the situation. What matters is how your listeners are reacting, not how you are reacting. For a simple story to be effective, it has to match the situation and it has to resonate. Think of your story and your model like a seesaw. When it is balanced, your listeners will make it obvious. And just remember, it's the listeners whose perspective counts, not yours. So, models, not descriptions, which match the situation and which resonate with others. That is appropriateness. Overwhelmed by the complex? Feel like you're staring at a maze? not if you have an appropriate narrative to tell. Thank you.